What's up guys, it's Dalmatter here and today we're going to be reacting to Linfamy's History of Japan Part 31. So this is how the Fujiwara rose to power. Uh, the Fujiwara being one of the most prominent clans for a long period of Japanese history. Um, if I'm not mistaken, almost a thousand years of them being a very important clan. Um, so yeah, this is the story of that. I'm actually not sure how they rose to power. I'm assuming it has something to do with like... Uh, either marrying into the royal family or winning a battle or something like that. That's usually how most clans or families become powerful within uh, different countries. Uh, so I'd assume it's probably the same with them, but I'm not entirely sure. So anyway, link to the original video down below. And again, this is Linfamy's How the Fujiwara Rose to Power. Let's jump into it. Dominated the Japanese court in the Nara and Heian periods. They started their power grab immediately out of the womb. Nakatomi no Kabatari was the founding father. He helped Emperor Tenji gain power through a coup, and so before Kamatari died, Emperor Tenji granted his coup buddy the surname of Fujiwara to honor him, thus starting the Fujiwara clan. The Nara Okay, so that's what happened. They were they were associated with uh getting the one brother on the throne. So see it's it usually has something to do with the royal family in one way or another. And I guess, like, technically there was no war in this case. There was some, like, assassinations and stuff, but makes sense. Nara period saw a constant battle for the throne between the Fujiwara and the imperial princes. Kamatari's son was Fujiwara no Fuito, and dude was a cunning and ambitious fox. Fuito found an ally in Empress Chito, who quickly lifted him up through the ranks. He was actually instrumental in drafting her reforms to strengthen the state. Fuito's game plan was, like many others, to marry his daughters into the imperial family. Yep. He married two daughters to a previous emperor, and when Emperor Monmu took office, took throne, he worked with Jito to organize the marriage between his daughter Miyako and Emperor Monmu. Miyako bore Monmu a son, Prince Obito. Under the tradition of Obito double royalty, Uchiha. their son could not become Monmu's heir because Miyako did not have a royal blood. She couldn't become Monmu's main consort. Monmu's heir had to come from one of his other consorts. Fuito wasn't okay with this tradition. One thing you gotta know about the Fujiwara is that they cared as much about tradition as your mom cares about not embarrassing you. Mm -hmm. Through scheming, he stripped Monmu's other two consorts of their consort's status, leaving the emperor with only Miyako. She became Monmu's de facto main consort, despite not having the title of main consort, which meant her son became the crown prince, the heir to the throne. Do the Japanese still do the inbreeding thing when it comes to the royal family? I'm actually, I, I want to check that out, the uh, Japanese royal family. I'm going to Google that real quick. Because, I, obviously, like, a lot of European countries stopped doing it, like, 100, 200, 300 years ago. Basically, when we started finding, like, you know, Gregor Mandel and uh, Darwin and that, we started finding out about genetics and evolution and stuff and how bad it was for inbreeding. Uh, a lot of Europeans stopped that, like, two, 300 years ago, but... I'm actually not sure if the Japanese did. I would assume they did. Um, let's see. Uh, the Empress Emirata. Uh, no, wait, no, that's... Um, oh, yeah, let's see Empress. Uh... Okay, she was born to a duke. No, it doesn't look like he has any royal blood. He he was also from the <coughs> he's also from the Fujiwara clan though, so Yeah, so the Fujiwara is obviously still powerful now 1300 years later. Um so, yeah, doesn't look like they do the inbreeding, although he is a Fujiwara, so there might be some inbreeding there. But, I mean, at, <clears throat> at that point, like, we're talking 1,300 years later, it's hard to say. You know, because technically, I think it's like every English person is descended of King John. If you have any English blood, you're probably descendant of King John. Uh, everyone with some European blood is a descendant of Charlemagne, right? So if you go back long enough, we're, you know, we're all related. And the, the you know, the more closely... You live to each other, the more likely it is to be recent. The others in court were pissed at this power play. 
particularly one of the Fujiwara's main rivals at the time, Prince Nagaya. Nagaya held one of the highest positions in court. He was the Sadaijin, the minister of the left. He was not a good enemy to have. Nagaya wanted to protect the imperial family, his family, from the Fujiwara invasion. Fuito had four sons, who eventually went on to found the four houses of the Fujiwara clan. Fuito thought, well, I've done a lot for my family, then died. <laughs> While Fuito had influence in court, there were two female rulers. When Emperor Monmu died, his son Obito was only six, too young to be emperor. There was also still much opposition to Obito from the non-Fujiwara factions in court. And so Monmu's mother ascended the throne and became Empress Genmei to hold on to power until Prince Obito came of age. At least that was the official reason. Genmei was the one who moved the capital from Fujiwara Kyo to Nara, by the way. When Obito came of age, Genmei did abdicate the throne in favor of her daughter, who became Empress Gensho. So Obito the Disappointed had to wait again. It's not really clear why Genmei did this. Maybe she thought that there was still strong opposition to Obito, that it would cause trouble for his reign. Or maybe she thought her competition- Literally, whenever I hear the name Obito, all I think is Obito Uchiha. I can't, I can't not think of Obito Uchiha when I see the name Obito. ...daughter was a better ruler. It really did seem like Genmei and Gensho weren't too fond of the Fujiwara. They kept appointing imperial princes to high court's positions instead of Fujiwara men. Gensho ruled for about nine years before finally abdicating in favor of Prince Obito, who became Emperor Shoumu. Now, after the death of Fujiwara no Fuito, Prince Nagaya became the most influential person in court, but not for long. Nagaya and his allies could not push back against the Fujiwara. That was clear when they could not stop Shomu from becoming emperor. The four Fujiwara brothers had enough of Prince Nagaya's complaints and accused him of planning a rebellion. Guards surrounded his residence and he was forced to commit suicide along with his wife and children. They also exiled a number of his supporters. And with that bit of business done, the Fujiwara four took control. They dominated the top tier of government. Although they were ruthless politically, they passed laws that benefited the common people. They got rid so this is something you see quite a bit in Japan, where the imperial family is technically still the imperial family, but another family or person holds most, if not all, of the political power. Um, probably the most famous example of this is the shogunate, right? Most people are familiar with the shogunate. It's one of the most famous periods in Japanese history, where you had you know all these different samurai warriors, usually the most powerful among them, uh, controlling... Uh, you know, different samurai clans and warriors, and the, and the most powerful among them would be basically the leader of Japan, although at the time Japan was very fractured. But technically, through that entire period, the, em the emperor still existed, the imperial family still existed. Um, and yeah, this is something you see quite a bit in J Japanese history. And be because of the the unique association with Japan, right? Again, like, if you look at Europe, you had the uh, rule through divine right, right? Which is basically, uh, you know, from the Catholic part of history, at least, it was, you know, the Pope appointed you or the Pope gave you, like, clearance to run, uh, to rule. Uh, and the, obviously, since the Pope was, the, you know, the manifestation of God on earth or the the, uh, the, the will of God on earth, uh, that meant that you had the will of God to rule. <clears throat> China had the, uh, I, I always forget the name of the Chinese one, um, the Mandate of Heaven, which was a little, in, in some ways, more secular it was kind of like pseudo-secular, pseudo-religious. Basically, the, the mandate of heaven said that, you know, whoever ruled, ruled because the gods decided that they ruled. Um, so it was kind of similar to the European system, but without the Pope. Uh, and basically, you know, it was, I guess the best way to put it was, you know, whoever had the power, therefore, ruled. Um, it, it, it's hard to put it into proper words. Uh, you know, I'm having difficulty with it right now. It's actually not that difficult, but... Um, Anyone familiar with the mandate of heaven understands. Uh, but then Japan had a, had a different system where because of Shintoism and the association with like the kami, which are like these semi-deity, semi-spirit type things, you have the Japanese royal family being viewed as gods themselves, right? Like the, the emperors of China usually, like in older Chinese history, sometimes they're viewed as gods, but like in... in more recent Chinese history for the last, like, 1,500 years or so, they were never viewed as gods. Uh, in European history, not since the days of the Roman Empire, 
had there been, you know, god kings or god emperors. Um, and so Japan, the royal family, still stayed the royal family even when they lost power. Rid of military conscription, reduced taxes by half, created hospitals and charitable organizations, and placed troops in outlying regions to keep the peace. <coughs> Not bad. <coughs> then, in the course, the Excuse Fujiwara me. scored a big political win. Their sister, Komio, was consort to Emperor Shomu, but Shomu had other consorts, and the Fujiwara brothers couldn't let a son of another consort become heir. And so, they promoted Komio to the rank of Kogo, or Empress Consort. It meant she was an empress, just not currently ruling. At the time, this meant one of her children would become the heir, regardless of how many children Shomu's other consorts had. This again enraged the others in courts, because the title of Empress Consort was traditionally granted only to royal women, not someone from an outsider clan. The courts grumbled. The Fujiwara asked if there was a problem, and the court said no. And then, when the Fujiwara Four were at the height of their power, something unexpected happened. It shows you how trivial the concerns of humans are in the face of Mother Nature. Years of careful planning and scheming can evaporate in a moment. In 735, a smallpox epidemic began Oof. raging across Japan, creeping towards the capital. Emperor Shomu, a devout Buddhist, had priests at all the shrines and temples pray for it to stop. Yeah, then you're gonna Surprisingly, help, buddy. it didn't stop. <laughs> we don't often talk about diseases, but they were a huge part of Japan's history, especially smallpox. Small. Yeah, honestly, diseases are, for most of human history, the number one killer, right? Um, honestly, in some ways, even today, right? Like, heart disease and cancer uh, are the number one killers, right? Like the, the number one and uh, number two thing you're going to die from in, a, in an advanced society is heart disease or cancer. So, yeah, I, you know, most of, most of history, it was stuff like smallpox and measles and influenza and uh, tuberculosis and, like, all of these other things, but the plague. Uh, but, yeah, like, the viruses have a massive impact on human society. And, like, obviously, the probably the best example of this is the con the conquest of the Americas by the Europeans was large and of Australia as well was largely you know done for them the second they landed here by viruses smallpox outbreaks ravaged Japan time after time this particular outbreak was the first ever recorded in Japan it lasted two years two devastating years it was a national emergency up to a third of the population perished the amount of deaths caused all kinds of damage, including to the economy, like we mentioned before. Emperor Shomu focused even more on helpful things like building Buddhist temples and encouraging Buddhist worship to protect the people. In the end, all four Fujiwara brothers succumbed to the disease, and the balance of power in court shifted away from the Fujiwara house and towards the imperial allies. However, the four Fujiwara houses continued on. Fujiwara power had already seeped through the foundations of the court. This young and ambitious clan was not going anywhere. Yo, leave a like and comment if you know what's good for you. Nah. Yeah, and obviously they didn't end up going anywhere because uh, when we just looked up the royal family of Japan, the current empress uh, is a Fujiwara. Her father was a Fujiwara. So obviously still one of the most powerful clans in Japan 1,300 years later, right? Um still quite literally in bed with the the Japanese Empire uh, or the Japanese Imperial family and uh, now her son will be well actually I think technically her son is the current emperor her grand and her grandson is gonna be the next emperor um so yeah they obviously did the right thing you know it worked out they're still you know one of the most powerful clans to this day um, now I get technically they would have been more powerful then because they were actually controlling everything whereas now, it's, you know, the imperial family. Although, although, I guess technically now it's the parliament, but you know what I mean. Uh, but anyway, let me know what you think below. Like, comment, subscribe, and I'll see you guys in the next one.